Amen. Good morning. How's everybody? You with me? Come on. All right. It's good to see everybody. Those of you sitting here, those in your cars, all you folks watching online, welcome to Have You Baptist Church. Um, you know, this is three and a half months we've been doing church outside the box. Uh, it's been crazy. We've been bringing the church house to your house. We've been out in the parking lot, and we've tried to do some things so we can continue as the church to be the church. Again, I just want to remind you, if you have a need, let us know. We'd love to help you out. Uh, if you know of a need, let us know. We'd love to help out in that situation. Our plan going forward, um, next week we're planning to move inside. How about that? Yeah. yeah. It's been almost four <laughs> months since we've been inside. Uh, that's our plan. Things may change. You know this uh, coronavirus is changing and things do every day. Um, hopefully they'll stay stable here in Colorado and we'll be able to do that. Uh, we're rearranging the auditorium, taking out a bunch of the chairs. We're going to have it spread out where we can social distance and we'd ask you if you would, if you'd wear a mask going in and coming out, um, you don't have to wear it while you're inside, but uh, let's just try to do our best to make sure we maintain the safest possible environment we can. Uh, we're planning to go inside, so we'll let you know if that changes. The best way for you to know that would be check your email. So uh, we'll send that word out as soon as we know, and uh, we'll go forward. Also. When you leave today, we're still giving these little booklets away. Many of you got one last week, The Apostles' Code by O.S. Hawkins. Uh, it's a daily devotional, 40 days. Uh, it's on the Holy Spirit and uh, just really good uh, reading and uh, devotional. So grab one of these if you hadn't already on your way out. Psalm 118.24 says, This is the day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Yeah. So you ready to rejoice? Yeah. Stand up. Yeah. Today is the day. Let's go.
stand upon your truth. I will stand upon your truth. All my days I live for you. All my days I live for you. And I will stand upon your truth. I will stand upon your truth. Amen, amen. So don't forget, you know, make sure that you're greeting one another in a, you know, in a distant, safe manner. So, you know, don't forget, you know, uh, stay connected with one another, even though we can't do the whole high five type of thing like that. So. What an amazing day, you know, it just, it's every, every, every Sunday we just come out here and you look over there, not a whole lot of churches get to, get to have that looming in the horizon. A beautiful and wonderful Pikes Peak. We just live in a beautiful place, an awesome place, and we serve an awesome God, so, Amen to that. which is really cool. So it just makes you want to just tell God just how awesome and how great He is. Yeah. We're going to do that right now. <laughs>
out your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing great.
exalted one, God of the universe, that God over each one of us individually is his creation. He is with us. Let's sing it out because you are with me. Because you're with me. Because you're with me. Because you're with me. I will not be. Because you're with me. about being outside is that we can look upon God's creation as we we're praising God and lifting him up and as we were practicing this morning the fox went through we had some beautiful birds come through we had some little prairie dogs too but <laughs> just the beauty that God has given us and just being able to be out in it and think God you're so mighty you're so awesome and you care for me just a little speck in the universe but you care for me you love me you sent your son for me and so, I don't know, I just felt like, man, it's just really cool this morning, just in God's presence and out in his creation. And so it's something just sort of special. And it'll be great to be in the building next week. It'll be, that's, that's good. But this is good too. And that's just a reminder that any time that you recognize God's presence, no matter where you are, it's a good thing. So let's just lift up one more time. I will exalt you. You are my God. I will exalt you. I will exalt you. I will Sorrows like sea billows roll. What 
Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well. thank you for loving us and we thank you that uh, God we can sing those words even in a very difficult and uh, times of struggle times of uh, unfairness and difficult situations that we can say it is well with my soul because of your love and your grace so God we just ask that you speak to our hearts right now in Jesus name I pray amen Amen. Those of you in the front here, go ahead and be seated, and uh, we'll get going. Uh, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 4 in just a minute for a few verses. I brought some books with me. I've got a four and a half hour sermon today. I'm preaching all of this, so you can all get a good sunburn and then uh, go home and deal with it, because I'm in the shade. <laughs> so, no, uh, we're starting this new series today. Uh, it's one I love to do. I've done it pretty much every summer since I've been here. Uh, summer hymn series on the hymns of the faith uh, called the series Then Sings My Soul. And I just want to give you a little bit of information in case you were wondering or you didn't know about it. A uh, couple of books that might be of interest to you. There's one called 101 Hymn Stories by Kenneth Osbeck. 101 Hymn Stories. When you finish that one, you can read 101 more hymn stories by the same guy, Kenneth Osbeck. Uh, he wrote that. There's also the book that I'm using uh, for this series, Then Sings My Soul. Uh, it's written by Robert Morgan, a very good book. Tells a lot of the background and stories behind the hymns. And then there's another book by Kenneth Osbeck that's called Amazing Grace, and it's kind of a repeat of some of his other books, but it's 366 inspiring, inspiring stories. Uh, it's a devotional, daily devotional, so 366. It even includes leap year, so it's a great book, and you can read this, go through this. It's called Amazing Grace by Kenneth Osbeck, Jr. So uh, we're going to begin this series, and, uh, you know... Uh, 
we all have a story. We all have different backgrounds. We all have different paths. God has brought us through. God has led us through. My story is not your story. Your story is not my story. It's one God has given you that God wants to use in your life. And God has a plan for your life. John Ortberg wrote a book. It's called All the Places to Go. And in that book, he talks about Ernest Hemingway. And Ernest Hemingway had a saying in there. It said, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. Six words. And you can just imagine the story. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. From that, a book came out. The name of the book was Not Quite What I Was Planning. It contained six-word memoirs from a lot of different people with stories about their life. For instance, one tooth, one cavity, life's cruel. Six words. Cursed with cancer, blessed with friends. Not a good Christian, but trying. Six words that kind of describe their lives. You can look at some people in Scripture. Abraham, for instance. Six words about Abraham. Left Ur. Had baby. Still laughing. Or you can think about Moses. Burning bush. Stone tablets. Charlton Heston. If you've seen the movie. Noah. Hated the rain. Loved the rainbow. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Manger, pain, joy. Cross, pain, joy. Six words. Horatio Spafford wrote one of the dearest hymns, most beloved hymns in the church today. It is well with my soul. Six words. Spafford was a successful attorney. He lived in Chicago uh, the latter part of the 19th century. He was a devoted husband, a godly man, loved his family, loved his wife, loved his children. Very, very active in his church. In fact, he was a part of Dwight Moody's church uh, back in the 18th, 1900s. Uh, lived out his faith. He knew the Bible well. He knew the Bible's teaching. He did his part to try to come alongside the church and help fulfill the Great Commission, helping those who were in need. Uh, prior to the Civil War, he was very active in the abolitionist movement. And on top of all of this, he was a very talented musician, very talented hymn writer. All these things we would say were very, very good. I mean, Horatio Spafford was a very good man. But he suffered some very, very serious blows. I mean, this guy was very familiar with the unfairness of life, the hurt, the difficulties that life brings. And it brings up the question, we've looked at it several times, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? I mean, in 1870, Spafford, his four-year-old son, you can imagine this, died of scarlet fever. A year later, 1871, the great fire in Chicago just devastated the city. He was heavily invested in real estate. He lost a fortune. Uh, just incredible stuff that he went through, anguish. He poured himself into his work. He poured himself into rebuilding the city. He tried to come along and helped the more than 100,000 people who were left homeless. Two years later, 1873, the city had rebounded somewhat. He was doing well, had kind of recovered a little bit, so he decided to take his family. It would be part family vacation, part mission trip. They were going to go to Europe, do some touring around Europe. Then they were going to link up with Dwight Moody, who would be conducting a revival in England and do some evangelistic work along with Moody. So they left Chicago, traveled to New York, and when they got to New York, they were to board a ship called the Villa du Haver. The Villa du Haver, a steamliner. And they were going to go to Europe on that. Last moment, 
an urgent matter came up, so Spafford, rather than making his family wait, decided to send them on ahead. He would finish his work, join them a few days later. So he gets his wife, Anna, his four daughters, Maggie, Tanetta, Anna, and Bessie, gets them on board the ship. It said that when he got them in their room, he just had this feeling of uneasiness, just not real comfortable. So he moved them to a different room toward the bow of the ship, and they said their goodbyes, and the ship was off. Then Robert Morgan describes in his book, Then Sings My Soul, here's what happens next. During the small hours of November 22, 1873, as the Villa du Haver glided over the smooth seas, the passengers were jolted from their bunks. The ship had collided with an iron sailing vessel and water poured in like Niagara. The Villa de Haver tilted dangerously. Screams of prayers, screams of oaths merged into a nightmare of unmeasured terror. Passengers clung to post, tumbled through darkness, were swept away by powerful currents of icy ocean. Loved ones fell from each other's grasp, disappeared into the foaming blackness. Within two hours, the mighty ship vanished beneath the waters. 226 fatalities, including all four of Spafford's daughters. His wife, Anna, was found nearly unconscious, hanging on to a piece of wreckage. When the 47 survivors landed in Cardiff, Wales, she cabled her husband, two words, saved alone. Horatio Spafford immediately booked passage to join his wife en route across the Atlantic Ocean. The captain of the ship called him and said, I think we're crossing where the Villa de Haver went down. Spafford went out to the rail of the ship and looked out across the ocean for a long time. Then he went to his cabin, couldn't sleep, and he got up and he said to himself, It is well. The will of God be done. From those words, he wrote this famous hymn that we love and that we sing, sung in churches all around the world every week. As you sing that opening phrase, you can just imagine Horatio Spafford standing on the deck of that ship looking out over the water on a cold December night when peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well with my soul Spafford wrote the words <clears throat> Philip Bliss wrote the music the music was written by Philip Bliss, was first heard as a solo in 1876 at a pastor's convention in Chicago. And it's just a great hymn that we love to sing. We can all relate to this hymn because at some point in our life and sometimes many, many times in our life, we've experienced heartbreak. We've experienced hardship. We've gone through difficult times. And I know there's times when it... It feels like for us that the sorrows, the, the hurt, the heartache comes just as constantly as the sea billows roll, one right after the other. And the reason this hymn is so comforting and it's so powerful that when sorrows seem to threaten us, when sorrows seem to overwhelm us, that we can be content because of what God has done for us and we can be, say the words that it is well with my soul even when it's not well with our life. First thing Spafford reminds us of is that having this peace that he talks about, that being content amongst the unfairness of life, amongst the struggles and difficulties, this contentment is something that must be learned. He writes in the first verse there, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say. 
it is well. It is well with my soul. In other words, we're not born with the, the ability to be happy. We're not born with the ability to be at peace. When we go through hardship and struggles, our default is not contentment and peace. It's exactly the opposite. Our default is discontentment. It struggles. This contentment he talks about is something that we have to learn because I mean, you know it. We're bent toward discontentment. We're never satisfied with what we have. I mean, you think about the iPhone. How many times a year do they come out with a new model of the iPhone? Every few months, there's a new iPhone out. I can't even keep up with it anymore. Golf clubs. I don't know how many of you play golf, but golf clubs, golf companies, manufacturers, they're coming out with new clubs every several months because people want the latest and greatest they want the newest models cars they come out with new models of cars all the time because we're not content with what we have clothing styles change all the time because we want something different I mean companies put out all this new stuff because they know we'll buy it in fact, this is a sad testimony about me, about our culture, our country right now, that corporations literally bank on making a profit from our discontentment. Isn't that a sad testimony about us? This peace that we're talking about, this contentment that we're talking about, this whatever my lot that I can say it as well. It must be learned. It must be developed. It's a discipline that we need in our lives. Paul had to discipline himself to be contentment. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23. Paul talks about some of the struggles, the difficulties he went through. I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Forty lashes was considered death. That was more than anyone could take. So the Jewish people, they learned how to do this. The Romans, they could take you right up to the brink of death. Forty lashes minus one. Paul went through that five times. Three times, he says, I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent the night on the open sea. I've been in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from fellow Jews, constantly on the move, danger in the city, danger in the country, danger at sea, danger from false believers. On top of all that, he said, I struggle and I hurt because I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Paul went through some serious struggles, some serious hurts. And he writes in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. He says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Learning implies that there was a teacher. Spafford says, Whatever my lot, God, you have taught me to say. God was his teacher. David suffered a lot. You remember David when he was anointed to be the next king? Saul wanted to kill him. He was on the run, on the move all the time. His life was at risk. David wrote in Psalm 119, verse 102, I have not departed from your law, talking about God, I have not departed from your law, for you yourself have taught me. This contentment is a learned behavior, a discipline. And God knows the teaching that we learn the best with is through experiences, that we walk through struggles, we walk through difficulties. It's a hard lesson, and no, we don't like it. Because we live in an instant fix society. I mean, we want instant gratification. We're impatient. We want it. We want it now. The only way we learn this contentment 
is to persevere through struggles, to walk through the hurt. And the more sorrows we go through, and the more we see God at work in our lives, we can look back and see that God was with us. And God never left us. And He never walked away from us. And even though we don't understand, we can trust in the Lord with all of our heart. That we don't look to our circumstances, but we look to God. And we trust in Him. And we know, as Romans 8, 28 says, that in all things, God works together for good for those who love Him, who've been called according to His purpose. He says all things work for good. Now, each thing may not be good. Isolated events are not good. We looked at this suffering a couple of weeks ago, and I told you this statement Chip Ingram heard when he was in college that he shared. And because we cannot see the future, because we do not know, we have to trust in God that all things work for good. Not each thing, but all things. The culmination of all things is good. And Chip Ingram says this, that God will bring about the best possible results through the best possible means for the most possible people for the longest possible period of time. And we can learn this as we walk with God, as we trust God. And when we go through hurt, when we go through struggles, our default is to run to God, not to run from God. That His presence becomes the most precious thing in our life. It's not all the stuff we have. It's not the circumstances we go through. It's being in the presence of God. So we sang a while ago, our hiding place, our refuge, our strength. His presence. It's the most important thing in our lives. A.W. Tozer said this, Sometimes we get overwhelmed and we forget how big God is. Sometimes we look at our circumstances and they just look so overwhelming. And we forget how big our God really is. David said in the very familiar Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. To say it another way, the Lord is my shepherd, he's all I need. Even in the midst of heartbreak, and struggle and pain as Paul wrote in Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength let me ask you how are you doing with contentment are you okay you content it's hard it's a struggle that we come to the point where we can trust God no matter what happens. Psalm 34, 18 says this, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and He saves those who are crushed in spirit. Contentment is a learned behavior. The second thing that we learn Spafford teaches us is that the greatest unfairness in life was actually suffered by God Himself. When His Son Jesus came to earth, and the cruel men hung him on the cross. And he took upon himself the sin of the world. All the way from Adam and Eve, that very first sin in the Garden of Eden, all the way up to now, my sin, your sin, all the sin that will be committed in the future. He took that upon himself because of his great love. You think about that. Jesus never did anything wrong innocent, pure, spotless, never sinned, was hung on a cross. John 1, 1 John 2, 2 says this, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, is the atoning sacrifice for our sin, not only for our sin, but also for the sin of the whole world. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness 
of God. You know, we live in an unfair world. We live in a world full of hurt and struggle and difficulty. But we're sinful creatures. We're sinful beings. Scripture says the wages of sin is death. Death is what we deserve. Spafford reminds us that the perfect Son of God, Jesus Christ, He wasn't exempt from hurt or pain. Why should we think we should be exempt? from struggles, from hurt. His only Son, crucified on a cross, unfairly, unjustly. Philip Yancey wrote this. He said, At once the cross revealed what kind of world we have and what kind of God we have. A world of gross unfairness and a God of sacrificial love. The greatest unfairness in life was suffered by Jesus and that should humble us and teach us that even through our heartaches even through our heartbreaks that puts life in perspective because of what Jesus did on the cross he can give us peace when it's not well with our soul or with our life it can be well with our soul Isaiah 53 5 says the punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed so yeah we face struggles we face difficulties and yeah ultimately one day we're going to face death but because of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice we're given eternal life we're going to live forever with Him. And we can really say, you know, death ain't no big deal. Because that's not the end for us. Death can't touch us. Death can't separate us from the love of God. The second verse Spafford wrote about, Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. I love that statement, that Christ has regarded my helpless estate. You see, Jesus didn't come down to earth to see how we were doing. He knew how we were doing. That's why He came to earth. We were broken, lost, sinners, separated forever from God. And Jesus came. He knew of our helpless estate and He came to redeem us and reconcile us to God. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin not in part but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. I told you earlier, Philip Bliss wrote the music to this hymn. Philip Bliss and his wife, after they premiered this song, they sang it. They received a telegram from Dwight Moody asking them to come to Chicago to sing at his church. So they took their two children to Philip Bliss's mother's house, left the children. They boarded a train, the Pacific Express. On their way to Chicago near Ashtabula, Ohio, the train went over a deep gorge, a deep cavern. The train bridge collapsed, and the train went 75 feet down into the chasm people screaming people hollered both Philip Bliss and his wife Lucy were killed on the train the story is that Philip Bliss actually survived the fall he was out and he was safe and he realized his wife was still in the train so he went back in to try to save her to rescue her and he was killed on the train him and his wife they were both 38 years old and you say, why? 
another good man serving God why would God do this when they found his suitcase and they opened up his suitcase they found the words to the latest hymn that he had written nobody had ever heard it nobody had ever seen it they found the words we sang it earlier I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love for me on the cruel cross he suffered from the curse to set me free sing oh sing of my Redeemer with his blood he purchased me on the cross he sealed my pardon paid the debt and made me free Bless knew just like Spafford did death couldn't touch him death couldn't hold him down like Job wrote in Job 19.25 I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth because our Redeemer lives because of his sacrifice we can have peace we can have contentment even in the middle of struggles even in the middle of difficulties that it can be well with our soul even when it's not well with our life and the last thing bliss tells or spafford tells us about is there'll be a day when there's no more unfairness no more hurt no more struggle no more pain i think as he stood on that ship rail as he thought about losing his daughters his son that he had lost previously he thought about a day that he eagerly longed for when he'd be in heaven with his children if you've ever experienced the loss of a loved one a parent a spouse a daughter or a son a brother or a sister a longing for the day when we'll be reunited and we'll worship Jesus forever and forever Spafford wrote about that Lord haste the day when the faith shall be sight the clouds be rolled back as a scroll the trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend praise the Lord praise the Lord oh my soul Jesus returns there'll be no more tears no more sorrow no more pain no more hurt no more unfairness no more death I think Anna Spafford believed in that day as well when she was reunited with her husband when he finally made it she said I have not lost my children we were only separated for a little while I love that phrase a little while we looked at that last week in 1 Peter chapter 5 the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast if you know it's temporary and you know there's a day coming where there'll be no more sorrow no more hurt then we can be content and we can say it is well with our soul if you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior you can do that right now. There's going to be a phone number, an email address come up on your screens for those of you watching online. 
for those of you here I can tell you this it'll never be well with your soul until you settle that that Jesus is your Lord and Savior maybe you've gone through a hurt through a struggle maybe you've gone through a loss like I mentioned here we can trust Jesus that he's going to bring about the best possible results for the most possible amount of people for the longest period of time by the best possible means. I don't know what that is. But we can trust Jesus. And we can say, it is well. It is well with my soul. Would you stand together with us? I 
pray this morning that God has spoken to your heart that we can walk away and say today it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul amen amen it's been a great day we're going to go out we're going to do some throwback 1970s Andre Crouch and I want you to sing this chorus with me Oh, through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, sing it again. Through it all, I've learned to depend upon His Word. Sing it again, through it all, all through it all. Yes. Do it all. I've learned. I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Do it all. Singing through it all. I've learned to Okay, you know it now. Sing it out. Through it all. Here we go. Do it all. Singing through it all, I've learned, I've learned to trust, I've learned, I've learned to trust in God, quit singing through it all, that's right, through it all, I've learned to depend upon His Word, amen, God bless you, have a great week.